latest investment offering, our 30th investment offering, the townhomes at Blue Bonnet Trails. We've been scouring the market for a BTR that made sense to us. And Judah found one in Dallas. It's in Southern Dallas in a up and coming emerging market in Waxahachie, Ellis County. It was built in 2020 initially, and then the last building was constructed in 2021. 114 units, average square foot, 1,843 square feet. This is exactly why we love this deal. Number one, this deal hits all the criteria we wanted. We wanted a, a top location, DFW fits that. Tons of migration, tons of growth, tons of jobs. It's a high quality asset. I mean, this was built literally like two or three years ago. There's no deferred maintenance. It shows well, it's 97% occupied. There's probably a wait list to get into this thing. Thirdly, it is a core plus strategy. What does that mean? Again, we talked about nicer, newer, newer vintages. That's what we're talking about. This is a essentially an A class property that attracts a higher level tenant base. We also want to make sure that this appreciates in value. And so the sub market is what we've analyzed very in detail. And there is a growth trajectory we're seeing around this uh, complex. So not only is the asset extraordinary, but the sub market as well. Now let's get into the numbers. This cap rate we got the deal at is almost at a 6% cap rate based on T3 numbers. The expense ratio is 49%. What that means is normally expense ratio is at 60, 70%. This is only 49%. It's easier to maintain this kind of property. The 100,000 unit shortage in DFW is promoting this high occupancy. One of the great things about this deal, it has a lower risk profile of a new deal, but the upside of those value add deals. Here's where the upside is. Rents are simply low, right? These people bought this property a number of years ago. It probably was not fully occupied yet. They added their value by filling all the units. And one of the ways they did that is by keeping rents lower than they were in the market. And now we have the opportunity to come in. It's fully stabilized. Operations really coming along nicely. Rents are simply low. Average in place, just about 24.55. Average market rents in the market, almost 2,700. All that means that we get to go in right now and start raising rents to market where they should be. And that's a beautiful delta. $240 per unit per month is a tremendous upside. We usually have to spend about $12,000, maybe $18,000 in order to get that type of upside. Again, lower risk, higher reward, and that's what's so attractive here. Double car attached garages inside unit entry. You sometimes are happy to find a property where half of the units have garages. You're happy if a quarter of those you can access from inside of the unit. Here, every single unit has a two car garage. It's actually on the back side of the units. So that means it leaves the front of their property open for a yard. So you see in class A, you invest $100,000 starting in year one, you're collecting that 10%, which equals a $10,000 payment that's broken down into 12 monthly distributions. And that goes on through year five. When we get to the disposition year in year five, you've received the returns that you're due. So you have the repayment of the $100,000 you invested and you've achieved a 1.5X multiple. For class B, you're getting slightly less in the cash flow. So you see it starts at 5,000 and trails up to 6,500 annually. So still same division by 12 for monthly payments, but you're getting that equity split of 70-30, which adds on $60,226. So you can see for the same whole period and the same investment amount, you're getting an extra $38,412. You're taking on a little bit more risk, but you're getting pretty nice reward for it, as it should be. Reserve class is gonna follow the same dynamics as class B, except the equity split is gonna shift from 70-30 to 80-20. So you see it's five times the investment, so the distributions look a little bit more, but they're the same percentage. But you can see you're getting closer to a 1.98 instead of a 1.8 equity multiple by investing through reserve. Like I said, reach out to my team. We can dive through this more if you have more questions. One of the other benefits of these deals is the bonus depreciation. What we do every time we acquire one of these properties is a cost segregation study. And what that allows us to do is accelerate the depreciation from the overall asset. You basically get to take the straight line depreciation and for certain tranches and buckets of things that depreciate at a lower rate, get accelerated into year one. So what the IRS has allowed for over the last few years was 100% bonus depreciation. So if the property creates 10 million and it's 100% bonus depreciation, you divide that 10 million by the amount of equity that comes into the deal. And that is the percentage that you get from your investment amount. 
Now that we're in 2024, it's been lowered to 60%. So that same $10 million of depreciation, we can now capture $6 million of bonus depreciation. So that $6 million will get divided by the same amount of equity. It'll be a lower amount, but also keep in mind as we go through the other years of this period, now that we're only accelerating 60%, there's more on the back end years. It's not all lost, but keep in mind that moving into 2025, the step down is going to continue. So it's 60% this year through the end of the year. So any property that's acquired before January 1st, will qualify for 60%. Starting January 1st through 2025, that same $10 million of depreciation is now only going to capture $4 million of depreciation. Three and four bedrooms. BTR units that have two bedrooms are in demand. We have three and four here. We're there already on site for the due diligence. I got pointed out to me where the bus stop is. This is a top school system, A-rated school system, one of the best ones in DFW. The school bus comes to the property. There's more than enough space. When we were doing diligence, I saw cribs. I saw homework stations. People are staying here for a long time, uh, driven by phenomenal unit mix of three and four bedrooms. These are not people that are looking to move somewhere for six months and skip town. These are people really investing in the community and living here for an extended period of time, increasing the tenancy periods, which by the way, brings down turn costs and reduces our operational expenses. Quality of finishes here. Granite countertops, modern shaker cabinets. It's really spacious. There's a kitchen, a full pantry, stainless steel appliances. They get washer dryer hookups. A lot of these units bring their own washer dryer. If not, we will provide them again for additional rent. Insanely large closets. The first floor bedroom and the four bedrooms have two walk-in closets for that first floor bedroom. Spacious and meant for that lifestyle that we're looking to attract. And this is the layout of the property. It's compact. It's driving a lot of revenue per acre. And on these gray kind of blocks around it, as Chris mentioned, you have single family homes, two, three, four bedroom with yards, kids in the neighborhood. It's one seamless area. We benefit from a much larger affluent housing community. This is a rent comp of the BTRs in DFW. Nearly $2,700 per month is the market rent. And again, we're well below that right now. $2 per square foot, and we're at $1.30 per square foot. This gives you an idea of the upside. These are data points that we look for, that we lean on. We're not kind of just kind of hoping for an increase, but this is really a measured statistical analysis that supported our investment thesis. We always look at a lot of factors, a lot of angles when looking to buy a property. One of them is replacement cost. If someone were to say, I wanted to build this property today, it would cost them $470,000 per unit to build this property. You gotta buy the land, you actually have to do the construction. If someone's gonna be buying that unit, again, this is per house, because we can sell them individually. The developer fee gets baked in. There's all the architecture plans, the engineering plans, and the soft costs. We're getting it for $160,000 discount per unit. So again, when we saw that, we knew there was value intrinsically there as well. As Chris mentioned, each one of these homes is separately parceled. If the DFW housing market continues as it has, exiting at a per unit basis to owner occupiers might be our exit strategy. One of the things is called the star. This is sort of the headquarters for the Cowboys, 91 acre complex created by Blue Star Development, which is Jerry Jones's development company. It's the economic impact is in the billions. What happened was there's a town north of Dallas, which many of you in Texas know, it's called Frisco. And it was just a sleepy town. And then suddenly it just became into this bustling center, the new Dallas, if you will. There's something called the gate, there's Wade Park, essentially entertainment complex, hotel complex, sporting complex, restaurants, shops, office parks all in a short five mile, in a mile radius. Universal has been looking for years to find the next location of one of their parks. They chose Frisco, Dallas, and it's gonna open in about 18 months. And this is gonna be a huge economic driver. The PGA Tour is now having us one of their main events in Frisco and one of these beautiful golf courses along with hotels and a conference center. So this is Jerry Jones. He is not only the Dallas Cowboys owner, but he is also a driver for tech, North Texas real estate. His company is called Blue Star Land Development, and pretty much where he decides to acquire land essentially sprouts up a new city. He has proven the concept in Frisco, and now seven minutes from our asset, Blue Bonnet, he is now creating a 120-acre mixed-use business park. His initial inception investment, we'll see what else he develops after that. Statistics about the DFW, second best real estate market in the country based on Price Waterhouse, median income 75K, 8 million current DFW residents, strong rent growth, 1,500 corporate headquarters, six largest economic output in the country, 4 million jobs. Current population is like 7, 8, 9 million. It's going to 
go through the roof over the years. This is also very business friendly and worker friendly. There's no state income tax, there's no imposed payroll tax. And 60,000 people moving every year into Dallas Fort Worth area. Ton of job growth, major employers in Texas. 21 of the Fortune 500 are here. So it is sort of a mecca for attracting top talent, top employers. And this is based on the educational system, the workforce, the infrastructure that's already there. Texas is the world's ninth largest economy with close to two trillion in GDP. The interesting thing is it's starting to become a headquarters for a lot of companies and very diversified economy. There's education, energy and mining, computer manufacturing, business and financial services, defense, security, health, construction, food. So if there's a recession, if there's a correction, if there's a slowdown in certain sectors, it doesn't make a huge dent in Dallas or Worth because they're so diversified. There's jobs everywhere. And the specific property where we're at, there is a diverse group of employers for that. And probably as we get the due diligence back, we'll probably find as what we find in a lot of our properties, a lot of ed and med. What that means is education and medicine, nurses, physicians, practitioners, all that kind of stuff, which are usually economically resilient employers. It's becoming a technoplex, meaning major high-tech hub, startups. There's a lot of tech industry and it's helping spur the Texas economy. This is the Dallas Park Bridge, economic impact about 300 billion, beautiful park, sort of think Central Park for Dallas. Baylor Scott White is a healthcare network. They are employing 6,000 active physicians, 40,000 employees, $2.5 billion of annual impact. McKesson, one of the big leading healthcare companies, decided to move from California to Texas, similar to how Elon decided to move a lot of his companies to Texas. And so there is a migration, there's a flight from California due to the regulations, and Texas is the recipient of that transition. Third business in the world, $37 billion of economic impact. Tons of attractions. The World Cup is coming to Dallas in 2026. They're predicting a $400 million impact. A lot of battery and storage is happening for electrical vehicles. And this company, Hexagon, is producing some of that. UT Southwestern Medical Center, this is interesting. A $5 billion pediatric health campus in Dallas is being created. They plan to care for over 3 million children in the Dallas-Fort Worth area. And they're building a $4.5 million square foot campus. One time I went to visit a friend in Austin. He took me to a mechanical bull. But if you really want to ride the real bulls, then you need to come to Mesquite, which is the official rodeo capital of Texas. $600 million of impact, which I was not expecting. And in more than that, because there's so much impact, they're building more. So there's a huge $4 million upgrade to the complex. The school system here is, are phenomenal. We have Southern Methodist S University, SMU, TCU, Texas Christian University, and many others, $27 billion of impact on based on the university system. North Texas football, $2.1 billion to the national economy. And obviously, the most valuable team in the world, they say, is the Cal Dallas Cowboys. Enterprise value of $9 billion, generates about a billion of impact. Other sports teams, Texas Rangers, the Mavericks, the Dallas Stars. There's an MLS team called FC Dallas Speedway. The DFW is recently ranked as number one for investor property returns in, in 2023. So that's important to note. And these are all the other highlighted cities. So as you can see, this is where Viking likes to hang out. These are the top cities that have the greatest returns. Our preliminary cost segregation analysis has about $6 million at the property. We're anticipating between 35 and 45% of your investment amount in a K-1 that you would be able to utilize when you file your taxes in 2025. Nelson has a great question. Is there cash flow in the deal? And when do we start receiving dividends? And then is it return on capital or return of capital? He's asking. Yeah, that's a great question. So yes, we have day one cash flow. It's going to be starting at 5% annualized. So if you invested 100,000, you're looking at 5,000 annually and you get that in monthly distributions. The way that we decide when we're going to start dividends or distributions is going to be based off of where we close in that month. So if we close on the 15th of November, you would get your first distribution. It'd be the rest of that month plus 30 days. So as low as 33 days and as much as 60 days later, you get your first distribution and then those continue monthly. They're asking about return on capital versus return of capital. Basically, like, are they going to get their principal back as well, as well as the returns? Yeah. So the way that we do it is we pay you a return on capital. We don't dilute you with the returns that you're getting. So your basis stays the same. You return that 
you earn that 7% preferred return based off of your original amount. And all of the distributions that you get are returns being generated from the amount of basis that you have in the deal. They're asking about IRA. How does that work? And can they use their funds and things like that? Yeah, absolutely. If you're interested in using IRA funds and you already have a self-directed IRA custodian, it's really easy. Really, the only differences are that the distributions, instead of going them directly to you, they go to your custodian and then you can redirect them from your self-directed IRA. If you don't have a self-directed IRA custodian, we have relationships with lots of great ones. Reach out to us. We'll make introductions to the folks that we know do a really good job at teaming up with you, get you set up and get as much information as we can to you right away. Serge is asking a great question. What happens after the five-year hold period? Right, exactly. So assuming that cap rates are where we want them to be, five years is an estimate. So we always look at this and we want to say around year three. And the reason we don't say year one or year two is that we need to have time to build NOI because building NOI is what's forcing appreciation on the property like that Performa slide we showed. So about year three, we've created usually pretty nice NOI growth. And if cap rates have compressed to a point where we can get the majority of the returns that we promise in five years and three years, we would 100% sell in year three. We're aligned with you all in the back end where all of our profits are coming from the sale of the asset as well. So we would love to sell early. Between year three and year five, really what we're looking at is what do we think the broader real estate market's gonna do? Do we think the cap rates are gonna compress? Are interest rates stable? Are they going to increase? Are they going to decrease? If you can kind of nail that down and at least what you think and what your thesis is, that's really going to determine when you sell. I have a couple of questions on why the owners are currently selling. Yeah, no, I think this is a great question and, and I've answered this one quite a bit lately. So it's a few reasons. So one of the things to keep in mind is the current owners are a REIT. So their motivations are different than somebody that is a smaller private equity group that isn't a huge institution. So the returns that they promise their investors, like if you were to invest in a REIT, you would usually expect a seven to 8% return, much lower than what we're going to offer you through that kind of institutional structure. So for them, it's partly timing. They've owned the property for X amount of time. But one thing that we learned was that this particular owner, when they structured the loan for this deal, used variable rate debt. And the question that they're having to ask themselves right now is do we want to pay for a rate cap extension? which could cost six, seven, eight hundred thousand dollars and see if the environment is in better in six months. Or do we want to, we've owned this property for four years, we've increased NOI, we're able to get a pretty good cap rate. You know, if we sell now, we can redeploy that capital into something else that's a really good basis, get our investors some of the money. That's the choice that they've made. So that's really the answer that they had to ask themselves. And that's really why we're getting the opportunity that we're getting is it just makes more sense for them to sell the property for us at this price than to kick the can down the road with a rate cap extension that's costly and try this again six months later. Yeah. And the second thing is, you know, I think they're the original developers or did they buy it from the developer? I think they bought it at stabilization from the original developer. And so when you're buying it at somewhat stabilization, the reds were probably markedly low. These guys, you know, had an incremental increase, but they're definitely not to market. So there's essentially, there's a lot of value add left on meat on the bill. And that's why we're, we're excited about it. How much equity is a sponsor putting in or a part of the, the GP? Yeah. So the way that we do equity and skin in the game is Vikram and Ravi always put, you know, between one and $200,000 of their own personal cash in the deal. We also have general partners that are part of the GP that also put money into the deal. In any event, however that's split up, the general partnership always puts at least 10% of the total amount of equity. So if they're if we're raising $20 million, the GP has put in $2 million of cash skin in the game to further strengthen that alignment between LP and GP. People are asking about rent delinquencies in the property. I don't think there's really much rent delinquency from based on the, the due diligence. Yeah, no, I actually, you know, had this question from one of our current investors that got a little head start on this deal. And I was chatting with Judah and Ed about this. And there isn't a ton of delinquency, but one of the reasons why we feel really great about this property is we feel like we're going to manage this property a lot better than the current seller. So we had an investor that actually went on site, talked to the leasing agent, and the leasing agent mentioned that there was a little bit of delinquency and that there might've been, you know, discounts that they were offering or concessions. And I think that that's really one of the opportunities. There's a lot of things that we noticed immediately when we got on site and we started looking through the rent roll that we saw as huge opportunities. One of them was there's two model units. 
why do you need two model units in a build to rent property? You probably get one of those functional and start renting right away. And really it has to do with when you're a really large institution that's managing thousands of assets, you aren't able to spend as much time as we are when we are, you know, a group of 25, a team of 25 folks, and we have 17 active projects and our asset manager is like a Hawkeye on the property management company that's managing each individual one of our assets. And these are the types of things that we really think we're going to be able to put into effect immediately. People are asking about who will Viking hire to manage the property. And also the other question was, when is the transaction date? What are the timelines? Yeah, so timeline's an easy one. I'll answer that one first. So we anticipate asking for funds end of October, first week of November. That's when the call for funds is gonna be. The earliest that we're gonna close this property is probably third week of November. However, what we've noticed with some of the other deals that we're currently closing right now is the agencies are really busy with the funds rate being decreased. Once they made that move in the five year and the 10 year decreased a bit, you have a lot of folks that are putting in applications for either refinances or to structuring new debt. So it is taking a little bit longer than we'd like, but for the most part, any seller we've worked with, any of the groups that we've worked with have been really gracious with extensions and, and helping get things done if the agencies are the ones holding up the process. So I would anticipate into this month is when we would really like to have funds in. If you need a little bit of extra time, just be vocal with my team. Let us know what you need, what how much time you need to do your due diligence, and we'll do our best to get you in the deal. So I think one of the great things that we've done that I've been impressed with is we use a third party property management company, but instead of having multiple third party property management companies in different parts of the country, we've built economies of scale with one. They were previously First Communities Management, were recently acquired by Asset Living, and they've built a team within their team that only focuses on our deals across the country and across our portfolio. So we like that aspect of working with a property management company. If things are slipping and they're not doing a good job, you know, you can't really fire yourself. You can only make yourself better. But if we see an asset, slipping, we can push them and push them and push them. And if for whatever reason doesn't get better, we can find someone that is able to and turn that around very quickly. At some point in Viking's future, you know, we have 10, 15,000 units under management. It might make sense to vertically integrate. But right now, the best mode of action for us is to continue to just have economies of scale with one really, really good third party property management company. Can you give them the minimum investments again? Yeah. So you have a minimum investment of 50,000 for class A and class B. And then a minimum investment of 500000 for reserve class. As, as highlighted here, there's a huge election coming up in the next 30 to 40 days. We don't know what's going to happen in the future. Whoever comes into power, renew the bonus appreciation. Will they reverse it? Will they get rid of it? I'm not sure. But I do know that you want to take advantage of it this year. It's 60% bonus appreciation, and it will help you save on taxes and maintain your wealth. And so there's multiple ways to invest. We have some assets, 1031 exchange. You can invest the trust, a self-directed 401k. If you have cash or savings, you have other assets that are not performing, you can liquidate them and invest here. Self-directed IRAs are also acceptable. We have links to book a call with my team. We're all on standby, ready to answer your questions, take you through the underwriting, answer your specific financial situation and see if this investment makes a lot of sense. Scan the QR code and the cool kids like to do this tech stuff. You can text townhomes. And so I suggest getting into this deal soon. I mean, it's probably, I don't know if we're going to be able to do another deal this year. We'll do our best to try to find another one, but probably this may be the last deal. So if you want that bonus appreciation, definitely take advantage of it. Book a call, multiple ways to do so. And so thank you guys. Appreciate you. Love all the support. Looking forward to you guys joining us on this project. And I hope you guys have a really good evening.